Okay, so I have a number of Ask the Pastor questions. Um, I'm actually going to be working through those over the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to do one today. Um, if you have your Bible, open to Ezekiel chapter 44. I'm going to kind of, I've got a couple of scriptures that I need to read so you can kind of understand the context of the question. So there are, there are several passages that we're going to look at. Uh, they're all fairly close uh, in chapters to each other. But we're to, to kind of give you some background, Ezekiel is, is writing out his vision of the, the new temple. And there are a couple of passages in here uh, that the question deals with. So starting in verse 1, uh, he says, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall remain shut, it shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it, for the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore, it shall remain shut. So let me just give you, yes, 44, 44, verse, uh, first couple of verses. Okay, so before we get into this any further, I want to... Uh, draw your attention to a couple things. Okay, First, the gate is facing east. There are three gates that we know of in his vision. One on the north, one on the south, one on the east. Okay, We're talking about the outer wall. Okay, So, God speaks to Ezekiel and the presence of God has come in through the east door and it has settled back in the temple. So he says, the gate on the east of the outer court will be shut and it will not be opened because the presence of God has used that gate. This gate is now holy, it's sanctified. Okay, so going down a little bit further, the end of verse 2 says, therefore it shall remain shut. Verse 3, only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gate and shall go out by the same way. Okay, now hold those things in thought because we're going to jump ahead to chapter 46. Okay. Chapter 46, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, the gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day it shall be opened and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The prince shall enter by the vestibule of the gate from outside, and shall take his stand by the post of the gate. The priest shall offer his burnt offerings and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out. But the gate shall not be shut until evening. Okay? So... Um, actually, let's, let's read a little bit further before I jump ahead. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of the gate before the Lord on the Sabbath and on the new moons. The burnt offering that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. Okay, and then he goes through what the prince is to offer. Okay, so one more passage and then I'll kind of get back to the question. Um And I've lost my place. Let me back up because I might actually be in the wrong chapter. Let me check. All right. I didn't write it down, so I was trusting my brain teaches me, doesn't it? Um, the, the question is, who is the prince? Who is the prince that comes in? Um, now, in Western thinking, this would appear to be obvious to us. 
Okay, now this is a, a temple that has not yet been built. Okay, so Ezekiel is looking to the post-exile temple, but we know that this is not the temple that was built by Zerubbabel and then modified by Herod because the dimensions, the description is wrong. So this is a temple yet to come. Okay, but there are certain things that are laid out in the scripture that are very specific to this question. And I think how God speaks through Ezekiel gives us a very clear answer as to who the prince is. Now the first thing you notice is there's no king doesn't talk about the king coming in or the king going out. It doesn't talk about the king offering sacrifices. I think this is significant. I believe this is because this is when God is the king. Okay, The very presence of God has come into the temple. I think this is a prophecy of the end of all things when God reclaims what is his. Okay, And if the king is God... Who does that make the prince? Jesus. Now, there's a couple other things that I think really point to this. First, when the prince comes in the outer court wall, he doesn't come in the east gate. He comes in the north or the south gate. He comes in with the people. He is identified as being with the people. So he comes into the outer court with the people, and yet there, the similarity ends, doesn't it? Because of all the people, he then travels to the east gate, and the east gate will be open for him to go in. Now, I believe that in these couple of passages, Ezekiel is talking about the hypostatic union. You go, what? He's talking about Jesus at one and the same time being fully God, thus being able to enter by the way that only God is allowed to enter. But also at that same time being fully man and identifying with humanity by coming in through the outer gates with them. I think he's saying, look, I have made myself like you, but I have not relinquished who I am. I am still God. I have become man, but I am still God. And so he comes in with the humanity through the outer wall. And then when he comes to go into the very presence of God, which is really ironic because he is God. <coughs> he is the only one that is allowed to go through that eastern gate. Now there are a couple other things that really jump out uh, when we, we read this. Um, the first is that the eastern gate on the outer door is never open. The second is that there are specific days that the inner door will be open as well. And that's on the Sabbath, and that's the new moon feast, when the prince is allowed to go in. And the, the passage that I, I can't find, I can't remember, it also says that this will be uh, open whenever the prince wants to offer a free will offering. So see, there are standards that are set up where God says it will be opened on these days. But the Son of God can have it open whenever He wants. And He can come in and He can go out to offer His free will offering. Uh, one of the other things that is, is kind of interesting about this is that when He offers the sacrifice, whose job was it to offer the sacrifice? The priests. And yet, Scripture talks about several kings that made sacrifice. One that did it, not right. Actually, he really kind of messed it up being Saul, who got impatient waiting for, for Samuel to come. And he said, hey, the battle's getting ready. We need to do this sacrifice. And, and he, he was looking at the sacrifice as the magic tool to win the battle. He wasn't to looking at what the sacrifice was about. The sacrifice was unto God who gives you the victory. It's not the sacrifice that gives you the victory. It's God. And so he messes up and, and ultimately has his kingdom stripped away from him. But we also know that David offered sacrifices. That David went in and he offered sacrifices. As a matter of fact, Scripture, uh, when, when the law was first laid out, when you brought your sacrifice, 
you were actually supposed to make the sacrifice. The, the, the man and the family would make the sacrifice. And, and then if, if a woman came and, and she didn't have her husband, there would be someone there that would take her. And then the, the process became kind of complicated because there's a lot of people making a lot of sacrifices. So it became uh, acceptable for them to lay their hands on the head of the sheep or the goat. And then they would hand it to the Levites and the Levites would take care of it for them. So the, the whole point of this being that, you know, we go, okay, well, why is Jesus offering sacrifice? He done did. He already did. The sacrifice is made. It's by his sacrifice that the door is open. So when he goes in to offer sacrifice, I don't think he's bringing a, a, a lamb. I think he is the lamb. Mm -hmm. I think he's going in and saying, hey, look, price is paid. It's done. Okay. I don't think he's hauling a sheep with him. I don't think he's hauling a goat or an ox. I, I don't think that's what's going on. I think he's coming before the Father and saying, hey, the blood price has been paid in full. It's done. It's taken care of. Okay? So I think these passages, they're obviously prophetic. Some people want to say, oh, okay, um, you know, this is for the post-exile, for the temple of Zerubbabel. It doesn't fit. There are little portions of it that you can squeeze and shoehorn in, but the entirety of the prophecy does not fit. I believe this is speaking about the temple that is yet to come when God will make his tabernacle with man. And we will need neither sun nor moon because the presence of God will light us. Okay? So this that's what I believe is going on here. Any questions about that? Any thoughts? Any insight? Beep. 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 Bum. Time's up. All right. <coughs> so, <clears throat> we are talking about the feasts. Uh, turn in your Bible... <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to wrap up the Sabbath. Um, I'm sorry, I already wrapped up the Sabbath. We're going to wrap up the Passover. And then in the next week, I'm, I'm hoping we can get the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was reading an article, actually I was reading two articles that both referred back to the same thing. And I'm going to do some research on this because I, I found it an interesting idea. Um, both articles written by two different people talk about what prompted the pilgrims to begin Thanksgiving. To have a particular day set aside to thank God. And, and we like to think in our Western culture, it's like, well, you know, of course they're going to take time to thank God. They're, this is important. God's brought them food. He's brought them shelter. He's taken care of them. Yeah, He's done that for all of us, but we've never set aside a day. Other countries, God has done that for the Christians, and they didn't set aside a day. Well, we're, that's because we're Americans. Yeah. I mean, we do things right. Right? Well, sometimes. Sometimes. But then as soon as we think we got it right, we get prideful and then we just lose it all. Okay? What both of these articles pointed to was that the pilgrims coming over would have been very familiar with the Jewish customs, specifically the feasts. Now, each of these feasts that we're working through is given so that the people will remember, so that the people will be thankful, so that the people will remember who to be thankful for, and, and those things. And both of these articles coming from two different places, two different directions, mention that it is their belief that the pilgrims actually took this day and made it special as a direct result of their knowledge of these feasts. Okay? So, if you want a challenge, here's my challenge, Join with me as we kind of dig into that and see if that's the case. Because if that's so, that's really cool. That is really awesome. Because that means that the church, which for so long denied its Jewish roots, there's life there. And there has been life there. Because we have to remember, as much as we want God to be an American, He's not. And when God chose to send His Son, He didn't send Him as a Republican. <laughs> he sent Him as the ultimate independent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was beholden to no man. And when He sent His Son, He sent Him 
as a Jew to fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham. He said, through you, through your seed, I will bless the nations. So, we need to remember that where this thing started, whatever reason God had, and He does list several, but for whatever reasons God had, He chose them out of all of humanity to be His special possession. That through Him, He might claim for Himself a bride for His Son. Okay? So, getting back in here, um, I'm just going to start in verse uh, 1 and 2, and then we'll jump down to verse 4. Uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Now we talked about the, the word for, for feast there is actually it's an appointed time. These, these are the times that I am setting aside. Because we look at feast and we think of Thanksgiving, you know, all the food that we had just a couple days ago. And if you're like my family, still have. You know, and, and you're just kind of working your way through. We, we make one meal for Thanksgiving and that prepares meals for the rest of the week and further. So, I mean, because really, what few people can eat a 16 pound anything? Thank God they had bones because, you know, otherwise we'd be eating for months. So... What the, 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 these convocations, these holy settings, aren't necessarily about having lots to eat. Okay? As a matter of fact, in some of them, they're actually going to fast. Okay? So, so when we read these, these things, he says, my appointed feasts, it's actually appointed times, and then holy convocation, that's us, because we are holy because we have the blood of Christ, we have accepted and exchanged our life of sin and been buried and resurrected into newness of life where we stand before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so we're holy. God has taken us from the mass, the profane, the common, the ordinary, and He's taken us out and through the cross and He's made us like Him, righteous and holy. No, you're not God. You never will be God. So don't even go there. There is one God. Coexistent, co-eternal, and three parts. You're not any one of those parts. Neither am I. Okay? So, these are His appointed times. Uh, the convocation just means a gathering. So right now we have a holy convocation because we have the righteousness of God gathering together. Alright? Um, so we're going to jump down to verse 4. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. Verse 5. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Okay? And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. Okay? Because... These are, are handed out, but there's further instructions as to how this was to happen. Now, we talked about this last week. I'm just going to brush on a little bit to catch you up. On the 10th day of the first month, does anybody remember what the first month is called? Nissan, Nissan but it's also called something else. Habib. Okay, so if you read in your Bible and it says the month of Habib, don't go, oh, wait a minute, pastor's lying. No, time is lying. Because back then it was a beep, and somewhere along the way they changed it to Nissan. Alright? So it's the same month. On the 10th, they had lamb selection day. And each family was to select a lamb to sacrifice for the Passover. Now, God being God knowing all things, He understood that some families were not going to be big enough to eat an entire lamb. So he, he directed them, if your household is small, then join with another household and go in together and bring a lamb. Okay? And then on the 10th, they would choose the lamb. And, and the, the, actually, on the 10th, the lambs were brought into Jerusalem and, and they would select their lamb and then they would take it with them back to their house and for the next four days, they would check the lamb they would test the lamb to make sure it was without spot or blemish, that it was a perfect and acceptable sacrifice. You go, whoop-de-doo. What's that got to do with us? 
I don't know. I know the lackeys have lambs or sheep or what, how, what are they? They're technically sheep now, right? I mean, at what age does a lamb become a sheep? Over a year old. Over a year old. So you got lambs too? All right. Um, they got lambs. Chops. Um, I'm talking about the puppet. You guys are thinking dinner. Um, so they would bring them in. They would inspect them. But what's really interesting about this, because God does nothing without purpose. God is not frivolous. God doesn't do something and go, you know, I really have no idea why I did that. I do that all the time. And, and so, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, He came on the 10th of Nisan. He came as the Lamb. He came into Jerusalem to be tested. And He went to the temple and He was tested by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the people. And they all got a chance to examine Him. And they found nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that when the, the Sanhedrin got together, the religious leaders got together, um, you know, they got together at a place in Jerusalem. Uh, Jeannie, what's the mountain called? The Mount of uh, Il... I'm sorry? Mount Zion? No, no, no. The, uh, where the, where um, the UN sits. Oh. <laughs> the Mount of Evil Council. Evil Council. That's it. They, they got together, and, and history says that they got together at this place that is called the Mount of Evil Council. And when we were in Jerusalem, they pointed out to us that that's where the UN currently sits in Israel, on the Mount of Evil Council. You know, God doesn't do anything without purpose. So, um, they decided, well, you know, we have to come up with a reason to kill him. Because he, the, the people are wanting to follow him. They're not going to listen to us. There's political ramifications, you know, that we've got to keep, keep who we are unto ourselves, but we also have these Roman masters, and, and there's a lot of things to consider here. And that's what happens when man starts thinking apart from the will of God. You start trying to figure out how to accomplish things on your own. You wander away from the will of God. And so they determined that they would find some way to accuse Him. Okay? And so, for four days, Jesus presented Himself to them. He went and He celebrated the Passover. We go, okay, why is that significant to me? Well, today, last week, we talked about a lot of the traditions that came up. Scripture tells us there were three components that were required for the Passover meal. Does anybody remember what those are? Can anybody remember we talked about the lamb? The lamb? Matzah. Matzah and the herbs, the bitter herbs. Okay, Those were the three things that Scripture required of the Jews when they celebrated. Um, they, they celebrated the lamb that was sacrificed, that the blood was put on the doors, the doorposts, and, and thus when the angel of death came through Egypt. Now, now think about this for a minute. We like to think, you know, in, in the TV show, The Ten Commandments or The Prince of Egypt, you know, there was like this one locality that the Spirit went through. It went through the entire land. Now, folks, if you go back and you look at what was historically Egypt at the time, that, that extends into about five countries today. And it went throughout the entire land. And any place that did not have the blood marked on the door, the firstborn died. Okay? So, required for the meal is the lamb that was sacrificed that the angel of death might pass over the Jews. The second thing is the matzah, the unleavened bread. Why is this important? Because God told them that when He was going to take them out of Egypt, it was going to happen so quick that they would not have time for the leaven to rise. So they needed to prepare bread without leaven. Now, I, I, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not a bread maker. I'm a bread eater. And I don't really understand a lot about this, but this was back before they had those fancy little yeast packets that you could mix in. So they, they used sourdough bread, and they would take a little bit of the old loaf and they would mix it in with the new ingredients, and, and there was how they got the yeast. It would activate the, the, the yeast, and, and, it, and it would make the bread leavened. Okay? 
Now, interestingly enough, most of the times throughout Scripture, when Scripture refers to leaven, it's using it in the context of what? Sin. I think this is a beautiful illustration of who we are as the people of God. Because when God takes us, He makes us anew. He doesn't take any of the old and bring it in and mix it together to come up with a combination, a hybrid. He makes us new. And it's that sin that we keep toying with. That's the leaven that we keep trying to bring into our life. And it does not mix. It should not mix with the unleavened bread. Now, interestingly enough, as we talked about the, the Jewish customs, their unleavened bread is the matzah. Ben, uh, did you go in that drawer or the, the counter right there on the right and grab a matzah for me? Kind of hungry. <laughs> on the right hand side. Um, Dennis came up and shared with us a little bit about the matzah and the afikoman and the matzatosh. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But this is what is required today for the celebration. And, and it is required in their writings um, that the matzah be striped and pierced. And, and their reasoning for this, why this is required, is because with the striping and the piercing, it does not allow any leaven that might be in the bread to activate. Now, I don't know how that works, but that seems to me kind of weird. Okay? I find it really weird that in order to prevent this, they both stripe it and pierce it. Remember what Scripture says, they will look upon the one they and they have pierced. Okay, and you look up into the light and you know, I can see you guys through this. <laughs> okay. And so, um, the matzah was required by Scripture as a remembrance of how God delivered them. The last thing was the bitter herbs. Okay. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of these things. But the point that I want to make is that this is what God said. Remember we talked about the boundaries, the circles. Okay. They did it just like we do. I'm not bad-mouthing the Jews and exonerating us. We do the same thing. Okay? Scripture says that women should dress modestly. How do you define modestly? Well, everybody defines it differently. You know, it wasn't that long ago that showing off your ankles was considered immodest. You know, in Japan, it wasn't that long ago that a woman showing her teeth was considered immodest. You floozies. <laughs> okay, so um, so what is modesty? All right, so the Jews took this directive and they said, well, if this is where God wants us, then we're going to go here so that we don't offend God. We're not going to make it. And then as time went by, they said, we're going to make it here so that we're really safe. Because if we don't cross this line, there's no way we'll approach this line that our forefathers gave us. Because that's an important line. Because they knew what they were talking about. And then, then we'll be safe from this. Now, the sad thing about this, the thing that breaks my heart in this, because I see this in churches today, um, especially churches that have been established for a long period of time, uh, denominations that, that have been around for a long period of time. We do the exact same thing. It's, it's inherent to the human condition. Okay? And, and what happens is the Word of God that He gives us is pure and unsoiled. We start to add to. And, and it's like loading rocks on top of a burden that is not supposed to be of weight. And, and then, because our forefathers added rocks in order to, to do better, we add more rocks and, and, and more traditions and more customs and more things that we have to do. And, and I look at Paul's writing in uh, Galatians chapter 5, and he says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do not be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Okay? And, and we, we take these burdens on ourselves. Why? Because it's easier to have a list of do's and don'ts than to operate in the freedom of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? If, if I make hard and fast rules, I know where safety lies. But those hard and fast rules oftentimes put us on the outside of communion and intimacy with God. And then over time, those hard and fast rules become more important and more significant to us than the very word that God has given us. 
Okay, so in the Seder, in the Passover meal, the Jews did the same thing. They took these three components and they made a list and, and it's something like 15 components long. Now, when they celebrate the Passover, they do a program called the Seder. Okay, what, do you remember what Seder means? Order. 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 Everything is done in a specific order. And, and part of the Seder is, are these different things, these different um, phases of the dinner. And, and it, it's very beautiful. It's also very, um, a lot more than what God called them to do. Is it wrong? I can't say that it's right or wrong. That's not for me to say. Who am I to judge another man's slave? Okay. But what I can say is that when that becomes your goal, you've missed the focus of what it's supposed to be about, and the focus is supposed to be about how God has delivered us. Okay? And in this Seder, they, they have what's called the telling, the Haggadah, or Haggadah. Okay? And that's the telling, that's the story. They read the story at particular times throughout. Now, we talked about the Passover, we talked about the, the specific point in the service where they took the, the three matzahs, and now this, this is a tradition. We don't know where it came from. We know that the start of the Haggadah that we have today, the start of the Seder that we have today, can be dated back to about 150, 160 uh, B.C. with the, uh, the Maccabean rule. And we know that it was solidified in its current form somewhere between the 8th and 9th century A.D. Okay? But what's really interesting about this is if you look at the Passover meal, the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, we see that he hit a number of those components that are still in the service today. And, and we know um, there were some significant things there, but the, the whole point of what I want you to get, okay, God's word as we have it today was written, was complete about 90 AD, okay? That's, that's, that's the latest that we can put any of the writing that we currently have. Actually, it's probably closer to about 70 AD because of the internal testimony of the writings themselves. We know that Jerusalem fell 70 AD, we, but there's no reference to the specific falling of Jerusalem. So that's a pretty significant event and you think that if, if the writers were writing about it, there would be some kind of something in there that it happened, and there's not. There's prophecy that it's going to happen. There's a foretelling that this is coming, but there's nothing that says it happened. So that really makes it clear to me that the, the books that we have today that God inspired were done before the fall of Jerusalem. All right? So, um, somewhere about... 8th or 9th century, they got the order of service. Now, there are some things that are in there that I believe God used. Now, just because God is not writing inspired scripture today, He's not speaking to people and adding to the testimony, that doesn't mean that God is not involved. That doesn't mean that God is not speaking. And I think looking at the Seder is a beautiful illustration of this because there were things that they put in and, and keep in mind that they, as they put this uh, Seder together, they drew from six sources. They, they drew from Scripture. They drew from the Mishnah. They drew from the commentaries. They drew from legend. They drew from uh, history. And um, I'm missing one. Just a second. I've got to look. Somebody should have this in your notes from last week. What was the sixth one? Blessings. The blessings that they would read over. The, the prayer blessings that they would read over each other. Okay, so there's, there are six components that would end into making this up. Now I'm going to hit a couple of things that are significant in the Seder because the Jews who are looking for a Savior to come, a Messiah to come, have written these things into the order of service about the Passover. The Passover feast is God's prophetic declaration of what He had done to Israel, 
delivering them out of slavery and bondage, and bringing them through baptism, through the Red Sea, and later through the, the Jordan River. He brought them through and he brought them out as a new people. They went in as a people fleeing Egypt, slaves on, slaves on the run, and they came out as a nation. All right, And God took them and put them in the place that He had declared was going to be theirs. All right, Now that is from their history, and that's what they're looking back to. But see, God was using that also as an illustration of prophecy of what He was going to do. Because when Jesus came, He took us out of our slavery to sin, something by which we could never do ourselves, and He delivered us unto a newness of life, and we become a new nation. We are a nation at one with all believers everywhere. This is a nation that supersedes national boundaries because it's not based on geography. Well, kind of it's based on geography, but you know we'll get to that in a little bit because God chose Jerusalem as the place where He would put His name. And, and so that's the geographical fix, the geographical center of his new nation. But it supersedes national boundaries. Okay? So we look at that and we see that this was fulfilled with the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So there's a couple of things that we want to talk about in this service. I'm going to hit them pretty quickly. So... Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 53. Everybody should have a familiarity of Isaiah 53, right? This is one of the most in-your-face prophecies about the coming of the Messiah as the suffering servant, as the lamb to be slain. Now, I'm just going to touch on this. This says that the one that is coming would be sacrificed for the many. Okay? It says that He is going to bear our iniquity. He is going to take upon Himself the iniquity of us some. Uh, that's not what it says, does it? What does it say? All. All. He said, uh, when, when Isaiah was prophesying, he said, He will bear the iniquity of us all. When, when John was writing in John uh, chapter 3, He's, he's recording the conversation that Jesus is having. And Jesus says um, that, uh, John 3.16, that because God loved the world, He sent His only Son, one and only Son, that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Okay? So, so we see that when Jesus came to the cross, now I, I don't care what your particular theological, doctrinal statement about predestination, preordination, free will, that, that, that really is irrelevant. Because God in His sovereignty sent His Son to die for the sins of the world. All of them. It says He took them all. Everything from Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel all the way through Peter's denial and, and the, the leader's execution of him all the way to where we are today in our stumblings and our failures and everything up to the end of time has been paid for. One price paid it all. Now, the difference is which are the ones that receive that. Okay? And that's where you get into theological disputes. So, the Passover is set up as a prophecy going forward. We see that Jesus is going to be the suffering servant, that He is going to take upon Himself our sins. Um, four times, Jesus is specifically called the Lamb of God. Interestingly enough, uh, the first two of them are by the, apostle, or the, uh, the prophet John. Uh, we see in John chapter 1, verse 29... Uh, John is out in the, in the wilderness. 
He's calling people to repentance. He's baptizing them. He's confronting the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of the day. And it, it says, uh, The next day he, being John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sins of the world. What a way to announce someone. Wow. What I mean, wow. John is the voice of one calling in the wilderness. He's the one that goes ahead to prepare the way. And here it is. You remember, you know, in the old times when they would announce people, the horns would blow, and there'd be everybody get their attention, and they turn and they look, and they'd rattle off this thing about who this person was, and what a great thing they'd done, or what a great family they were from, and what positions they held. And this is this is that announcement, folks. But it doesn't end here, does it? Because the next day, the following day, going down to verse 35 and 36. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Now we look at that and we go, okay, oh, well, you know, we, we've grown up in a culture where the Lamb, Jesus is the Lamb, and the Lamb is, you know, and, and okay, what's that? We don't understand the significance of this because we've never had to sacrifice. We've never had to go up yearly, annually, frequently to offer sacrifice that our sins might be covered over. When John is saying this to Jews all around him, he is declaring something that is so woven into the nature of their faith that they're like, whoa, what? This guy's the lamb? Not a lamb. The lamb. The lamb of God. Not one from the flock that we just went out and picked. Uh, I like that one. God chose him. God sent him. God was going to allow him to be sacrificed. And John is making this announcement and he is declaring to all the people for all to hear, this is the Lamb. This is the sacrifice. We go, okay, so okay, so he's a Lamb and, and, and it's going to be sacrificed and, and, and it's going to be good. Right. But then God has a little something to say about that later as well, doesn't he? Because when John baptizes Jesus and he comes out, the announcement isn't done. God wasn't satisfied with just John announcing it. God opens up heaven and that voice comes down and, and he says, This is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> what would you give to have the heavens open up and God to speak down and say, This is my son. He's talking about you. This is my daughter. He's talking about you. Whom I love and with whom I am pleased. Do you ever wonder about that? Because that's how he feels about you. Wow, well, man, uh, you know, I, I screw up. I, I've got things that I struggle with. You betcha. You betcha. And, and that's why, in order to satisfy his justice, and in order to express the full magnitude of his love, the cross... <laughs> is the center of all things because that's where the absolute justice of God where there can be no hint of sin and the absolute love of God where His heart is poured into His creation His sons and daughters meet. That's what it's about. Okay, So on the doorposts, the blood. On the lintel, on the mantle and the tops and, the, and, and where would the blood drip? See, there, there was the crown of thorns. There were the two hands. There were the feet. You cannot enter but you go through the blood. When, when the Jews sacrificed in Egypt, they put the blood up and then they were to enter the house and they were not to come out until God called them out. And, and they had to go through the blood. Okay. And then the, the meal was, was taken the, the lamb that was sacrificed for them was consumed and, and they, they partook of it. And, and we look at these things and, and the process, there are the, the four cups of blessing, um, you know, and, and the third cup, the cup of redemption, and, and the bread, the matzah. Jesus took those specific things out of the Seder and he said, hey, look, this is me. I, I am the lamb, but see, look, I, 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 this is my flesh. This is my flesh being broken for you. And, and you know, you gotta, 
that because the disciples, their minds were, were still clouded. Their eyes were still blind. We look at them and go, how did you guys not get this? You wouldn't have gotten it either. I wouldn't have gotten it because it wasn't time yet. The revelation was not ready yet. And so they, they took the bread and they ate it. And then they took the third cup the, after the meal, the cup of redemption. The, by the way, the, the piece that they took and they ate was the Alpha Coleman. This is the part of the, the matzah that was broken and was buried, was hidden, and then was resurrected again. And it's the dessert. You take the piece of, everybody takes a piece, the master breaks a piece, he gives it to you and he gives it to you. And then it's the dessert and that's the part you eat. The, Jesus is telling them, hey, look, this is my body. I am the one that is going to be broken. I am the one that is going to be buried. I'm the one that's going to be resurrected again. And if you don't have me, you don't have life. Okay? And then he takes a third cup, the cup of redemption where you have to pay a price to get something set free. Okay? And so there's the, the cup, and he takes it and he says, this is my blood. Now, we look at this and we, we don't really understand how significant blood is because in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, God made it very clear to them that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Why? Because life is in the blood. I don't know a single one of you that has a special ability that you could be living and working and functioning with no blood. Doesn't work. I know some of us that operate fully well with no brain. <laughs> but without blood, it doesn't work. Okay? So, Jesus takes that and he says, this cup, this cup is my blood. And it's a new covenant. It's a, it's a better covenant. The, the other covenant, it was lacking. But this covenant is good in every way this covenant is good because I'm paying the price for everything. And it's my blood. The perfect spotless blood that has life in it. You know when he says that there's uh, life in the blood, you understand that, that, that uh, God gave us life, right? He breathed life into us. And without that, we would not have anything functioning. You know that it was Jesus that actually did that component, right? Because it says, by Him and through Him and for Him were all things made. Okay? So when Jesus is speaking these things, He knows what He's talking about because He was there. This is my blood shed for you, the blood of a new covenant. And then He tells them, do this in remembrance of Me. The whole purpose of each of these feasts is to remember and the Passover especially, because God gave them an identity that they did not have prior to this. When Passover came, God used that to make for Himself a people, a nation, His very own. And so God is telling them, remember, remember, remember where you came from. And then Jesus speaking forth to us in communion says, remember where you came from. Because you were in slavery, you were in bondage, and I set you free. Amen? Amen. 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 Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> every morning I come in before church and I pray. I pray over each and every one of your seats. And, and I ask God to accomplish what He desires in anybody who is sitting in that chair life, that, that He would do what He wants, that He would bring healing, body, soul, and spirit, that He would bring provision for whatever is needed, and that if there would be any that would be in this seat today, Father, that does not know You, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would not walk away from here without having encountered the Almighty God. And I, I, I want to tell you today, that is your choice. God wants to meet with you. Scripture makes it plain. You are His beloved. He desires to have relationship with you. He longs for intimacy with you. He wants to be everything that you need. You know, the, the sad thing about it is so often we go through our lives looking forward to that time when we will be married. So we will have finally a, a partner that will meet all those needs that we have. And unfortunately, we take what is supposed to be solely the area of God alone to provide and meet every one of our needs. And we put that burden on our spouse. And then we wonder why marriages struggle. Because I've not met a man yet that can be the perfect husband. 
And I've not yet a, met a woman yet that can be the perfect wife. And yet God can be everything that you need every time you need. So I'm just going to offer right now, if there is anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior, as the Redeemer, the one who paid the price that you can be set free, that today is the day of salvation. There is no promise of tomorrow. But today He promises that if you call out, He will meet you. He will be everything that you need. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will grow you. He will stretch you. He will make you to be like Him. And, and sometimes that's hard, folks. Sometimes it's hard. Discipline. And Scripture says nobody enjoys discipline. But it brings about harvest. It brings about something better. So if there is anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ, bow your heads, close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes, everybody. Everybody. If there is anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you don't know for sure that in eternity you will be embraced by a loving God. I just slip your hand up. We're going to pray over you. Just slip your hand up. Because today, I don't want anyone walking away from here today without a surety that God has you in the palm of His hand. And when He takes hold of you, there is nothing that can shake you loose. Let's pray. Father, You have done everything for us. Father, Your Word tells us what do we have that we did not receive. Even our very lives You have given. The breath that sustains us You have given. You have put us in these places. Father, some in places of, of rest and, and, and recovery, some in places of hardship, some in places of just the mundaneness of life. But You have put each of us in those places for a purpose that through us you might accomplish your will and in us your will would be done. And so Father, I am asking today, Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you, that Father, today would be the day of their salvation. That they would let go of whatever it is they are holding on to so desperately. They would let go and they would reach out and grab your hand. Father, even as Peter did when he stepped out on the water and, and he began to sink and he called out to the one he knew could save him. And Jesus reached out and grabbed his hand. And I ask, Father, that you would accomplish these things, that you would make of your people, Father, for the believers here, Father, that you would refine us, that, Father, you would put us in the fire, that the dross would be burned off, that, Father, we might stand before you in purity. Father, that we might be a people that would bring you pleasure. That, Father, we would go where you send us. That we would speak as you tell us. That, Father, we would love as you have loved us. Help us, Father, to not be so caught up in our culture that we miss your heart. To not be so caught up in, in those things that, that titillate and entertain or, Father, even restrain. But, Father, that we would willingly embrace you and all that you have for us. Father, that we would be willing to lay down whatever it is you ask of us, those things that would distract, that we might be more like you. God, that you would accomplish your will 